My name is Delara Derek Shani, and I serve as Director of Policy at the Data Transfer Initiative. Thank you so, thank you, thank you so much to everyone who has joined us here in person today uh, in Washington, D.C., and to the many, many folks who are joining us on the live stream from all around the globe. This is our organization's first. Uh, ever all day in person summit and the th thank you again we have we have an enthusiastic crowd here this morning I love it thank you um, and we are just so uh, so the theme of the day is as user empowered and user empowerment through data portability and we are so very thrilled about our diverse lineup we're looking forward to an interactive day among speakers and the audience as well um, and we have a very full lineup so without further ado I'd like to welcome I'm the executive director of the Data Transfer Initiative, Chris Riley. Morning, everybody. Afternoon, if anyone is in Europe, which I expect some people are. I should make this a little higher. Let me start by talking a little bit about the Data Transfer Initiative. For those of you who haven't heard my spiel on this before, uh, several years ago, a few technology companies came together to create something called the Data Transfer Project. This was an initiative to build open source, user-facing, direct data transfer tools to make it easier for people to move their data from one online service to another. Uh, I started engaging with the DTP at that time, several years back, when I was working at Mozilla uh, on the policy team there. And I was always sort of intrigued by the potential and the ideas of making data portability more real. So fast forward a few years, in 2022, three of the companies that were actively engaged in the data transfer project, Google, Apple, and Meta, got together and decided to put together this organization. They, they created an independent nonprofit organization and then uh, gave me the keys to it. So I've been having fun with this over the past year. Uh, and this, the Data Transfer Initiative, as a, a US-based independent 501c4 nonprofit, is carrying forward the mission and expanding in many ways the mission of the Data Transfer Project. So a big part of our organization's remit is continuing to build user-facing tools, technologies, to help people move their data from one service to another online, and engaging across the spectrum, wherever we can facilitate data portability and practice, uh, we're eager and excited to do that. Uh, and the other part is uh, working with policymakers. So working here in the US, in Brussels, as the European Union continues to advance the Digital Markets Act and other activities, and, uh, and, and really trying to contribute the expertise that we have and that we have built as an organization to help make this all be more effective. We feel kind of like a nonprofit startup, if that's a thing, at least to me. We're small, we're extremely ambitious, we don't know exactly what DTI will look like a few years from now. We're at the same time trying to have a positive impact on portability as it is today, and also look to the long term at what policy, at, for, at what data portability can be uh, for in the future years down the road. This isn't an easy task, but we feel like we're doing it at the right time. This is the beginning of the era of data portability, at least as far as I'm concerned. And we're here to help shape that and to help bring that about. But this isn't something this organization can do alone. We're very much not like a tech startup in one critical way. Our work isn't isolated. On a technology level, at least, as I'm fond of saying, data portability takes two, at least. And the most success comes when we have the most alignment, when we can agree on things like a shared format and a data model to represent a user's experience, and a shared approach to building trust among different providers. It's the same with public policy as it is in tech. The world of tech policy may once have been shaped with individual heroes with big ideas. That's not the world we live in today. If you wanna get something done, you need an extensive and diverse network of people aligning around a shared goal and vision. I believe that all of us in the room and on the live stream today are here because at least at a high level, we share a vision. That vision is that data portability can be a powerful force to empower people. We might have some disagreements about how effective things are today, or what specifically could be done differently to help make that future more of a reality. These are valid points of discussion. I hope a lot of them come up today. I believe very much that some of them will be in the discussions on the panels. I'm looking forward to our discussion panels. The first this morning on the business case for data portability, the second this afternoon on laws levers of power in the ecosystem. Regardless of where we might disagree, one thing that I think we can all agree on is that there are questions that we don't have answers to. So part of this event 
is uh, diverging from the sort of standard Washington, D.C. panel discussion model. We have seven original policy papers that are being presented, new analysis and ideas that help raise the baseline of awareness and of both the current state of data portability and the opportunities ahead for its future. This is a mix of content, these papers and this discussion, and it re reflects, I think, our ambition for today's event and the complexity of data portability itself. We can't get to that with any one kind of thing. So yes, we have panel discussions, we have scholarship, we have a fireside chat with, in my opinion, one of the best tech policy people in the executive branch, Travis Hall, uh, who's been working on these issues in NTIA for many years. We have a lightning talk from Suki Galati from Consumer Reports. It's been a leader in helping empower people for close to a century now. And we're honored to welcome leaders from industry who will share their experience working day to day to resolve these uh, trade-offs and complexities, turning these values and policies into practice. And mixed with substantive discussions, we're going to have coffee breaks, lunch, reception. Any good conference is worth more than just the sessions. It's also the people you meet in the hallways, the partnerships you build to sustain the work to come. This day is a moment in time. Where we go after today matters more. My hope is that everyone engaging here will learn something new and meet someone new. And in so doing, be more prepared to pursue your goals, particularly where they help advance our mission, which I hope is a mission we all share, empowering people by building a healthy data portability ecosystem. With that, I'd like to welcome the esteemed Senator from Massachusetts, who I've been a fan of for a very long time, Senator Markey, to give some additional opening remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you. So no, glad to so have glad you here. To be here. Uh, honored to be here. Uh, with this uh, distinguished group of uh, digerati, you know, the, the aristocracy of the digital economy, the forward thinking, you know, path, you know, cutting, um, boundary breaking, uh, monopoly hating, <coughs> uh, uh, barrier <coughs> uh, warriors. And so it is just so great to be with all of you here today. Um, and uh, just the very fact that we all know that there's such a thing as uh, data transfer initiatives, data transfer summit, whatever that means, okay? But we just mean it's kind of like the operating principle for the United States and the world, you know? And except for that, you know, no small deal about how everything operates. So I want to uh, thank all of you for inviting me here today. It's just such a great... Um, you know, uh, honor and uh, Chris Riley for inviting me. Uh, thank you for hosting. Thank you for making all of this um, uh, possible for me. He's been an important partner over the years, especially on the critical issue of net neutrality. Uh, the topics of today's event, data portability and interoperability, are near and dear to my heart because at their root, Data portability and interoperability are about competition. Not just any competition, but paranoia-inducing Darwinian competition uh, where uh, technologies make it possible for data, for ideas, uh, to be able to compete in the open marketplace. Because for most of my career, I have been working to infuse competition into static industries and to enable feisty startups to challenge the languishing, contented incumbents, no longer innovators, but now wall builders to protect what they had and to lock it all in place, you know, without any real chance now to challenge how the world should operate. So 28 years ago, I was the Democratic author of the Telecommunications Act, uh, which helped to launch the digital and communications revolution by bringing a much needed dose of competition into the telecommunications marketplace. So the Telecom Act included a number of critical provisions that are particularly relevant for today's conversation. Most importantly, the act sought to create competition in the local telephone market, then dominated by the baby bells that were spun out of AT&T by requiring telecom carriers to interconnect with each other 
at a just and reasonable and non-discriminatory rate. Radical concepts, non-discrimination, just, reasonable. These should not be contested principles, but of course when you already have the monopoly, they are, because that's the business model. So that provision in the 1996 Telecommunications Act was designed to ensure that startup providers could enter the local telephone market and compete with the incumbents. This interconnection requirement was a central piece of the 1996 Telecommunications Act and is based on the same fundamental principle as interoperability proposals today. Opening up closed networks to new competition, new innovation, new ways of thinking about the world. So the Telecom Act also included an important provision to allow telephone subscribers to keep the same phone number when they transfer to a new provider, a concept known as number portability. When I was a boy, my telephone number was MA40815. And my mother said, Eddie, if you're ever in an accident, there's two things. If you're in the emergency room, one, your telephone number is MA40815, and just change your underpants every day because I'm going to be so embarrassed uh, if you're in the emergency room and you have on dirty underpants, okay? So the admonitions of your mother grip your brain for your entire life. Well, then they changed the number to 3240815. And now my telephone number up in Boston is 781-324-0815. So that's my number. Oh, why can't I transfer that number? Why can't I keep my number? It's the number my mother told me to call in case of an emergency. And when you're a senator uh, in a... a um, a MAGA-controlled House and Senate, you need an emergency number you can call. That You know the number immediately. I need help. I can't believe what's happening in this committee, this conference committee. So that's the number. So this whole concept of number, portability, number portability, you know, is something that you just had to continue to fight to protect. And allowing subscribers to keep their phone numbers removed a serious obstacle to switching providers, moving over to another company. I'm moving over with my number. You know, you don't own these numbers. These numbers are, you know, related to the individual who has been using them and memorizing them since they were kids. And the way to do it instead is to say, no, we're going to force you to compete on price. We're going to ultimately fight as a result for cheaper phone bills for our consumers, but it can't be over your number. It's over better service, lower prices, easy accessibility, you know, for the individual to be able to work. So these twin ideas, interoperability and data portability, were foundational to our efforts to bring competition into the concentrated local telephone industry of the 1990s. By the way, an industry that economists had basically said is a natural monopoly. You know, the, the cable wire, natural monopoly. Electricity wire, natural monopoly. Telephone wire, natural monopoly. Can only be one wire per, per uh, industry going down the street. Of course, that's a way of saying the electricity industry, oh, no, no, we don't want any of that wind and solar. We don't want uh, ways in which you can have community solar. We don't want ways in which you can have uh, uh, satellite dishes. We don't want ways in which you can have other local phone providers. So technology was evolving at such a pace that it made it possible for us to introduce competition. New technologies, new ways of thinking about this. But again, the, the way in which the big companies whoever owned one of those three wires in the local community, they would go to their local Department of Public Utilities 
they would come to the Congress and say, please protect us. We're a natural monopoly. You will undermine the reliability of the whole system if you allow for these people to come in here with their new technologies. Okay? So that's why the 1996 Telecommunications Act was necessary. And today, at a moment when we are staring down new digital gatekeepers, these ideas have renewed relevancy. In fact, these principles may be even more important today than ever before. Over the past 20 years, we have seen how the internet, despite the promise of decentralization, is prone to centralized control by a handful of companies. Today, the vast majority of internet traffic goes to just a small group of companies, which are effectively monopolies in their own given marketplace. Different scholars and tech experts have identified different reasons for this tendency towards centralization, from the importance of network effects to the competitive advantage of each uh, company's data collection systems. And I won't adjudicate this debate today, but I'm glad that data portability and interoperability are a part of this conversation. Because as we saw in the 1990s, when networks operate like natural monopolies, these two ideas have the power to infuse competition into centralized markets. As we think about these issues today, we still have a lot to learn, both technically and policy-wise. How can we design protocols to allow different social media networks to securely communicate with each other? Will users take advantage of their right to move their data? How will the incumbents respond to interoperability and data portability requirements? And how will these provisions impact user privacy? Fortunately, we are about to learn a lot in the near future. Because over the last couple of years, we have seen an explosion of new platforms, from Mastodon to Blue Sky, that are providing their users with new rights around data portability and interoperability. And these efforts are new but growing, and I'm following them very, very closely, as is my staff, uh, led by my counsel, Danny Vinnick, who is right over here, who each of you should uh, get to know and to feel free to call on my staff. In addition, in Europe, the Digital Markets Act is imposing groundbreaking new data portability requirements on large online platforms, while also requiring large messaging platforms to interoperate with each other. These provisions are just taking effect, but they'll provide critical information to begin answering the important technical and policy questions that I mentioned earlier. Finally, as demonstrated by the fascinating work being presented at today's summit, researchers have launched a series of projects to better understand the impact and importance of data portability and interoperability measures. I'm glad that Chris and Data Transfer Initiative are helping to advance our knowledge of these critical issues. In closing, I want to take a minute to pull back the curtain on data portability and interoperability. For everyone in this room, these words are second nature. We've been debating them in one form or another for decades. But data portability and interoperability don't exactly roll off the tongue. For most people, these are foreign concepts, a strange new language used by techies too confusing for everyday social media users. That's why we must articulate why these principles are so important. Because ultimately, data portability and interoperability are about freedom. The freedom to control your own data. The freedom to message friends and family across any platform. The freedom to click, to swipe, and like on an open, dynamic, and free internet. For over two decades, I have been fighting for that internet. I've been fighting for net neutrality pr protections, which the Federal Communications Commission is rightly implementing. 
I have been fighting for data privacy protections, especially for children through legislation like my Children and Teens Online Privacy Protection Act, which passed unanimously through the Senate Commerce Committee and is now heading for the floor of the United States Senate, I hope, in 1998, two years after the Communications Act, I was able to put protections on for children under the age of 12, under the age of 13, rather, but the companies blocked me from teenagers and blocked me from putting on privacy protections for adults. So at a minimum, we're going to raise it up to under 17 this year because we need to do that. As we learn more, the laws have to evolve. We have to build in the protections which guarantee that the Internet is vibrant, dynamic, uh, but simultaneously safe. And I've been fighting to crack open closed networks through policy ideas like interoperability and data portability. So I thank you again to Data Transfer Initiative for hosting today's summit and helping to develop a clearer picture of how interoperability and data portability can turn all of our vision of a dynamic, open, and free internet into a reality. It should be a chaotic, it should be a uncontrolled environment uh, in which everyone is able to fully control their own data, their own identity, uh, and to move it where they want to move it. That's what today's all about. That's why this discussion is so important. That's why I'm so grateful for you for staying in this fight and moving with the technology so that we infuse um, this generation's technology with the same values, the same uh, goals that we've had in the past. So thank you all so much for inviting me here. And uh, if any of you, you know, want to be in touch with us, Danny Vinnick, V-I-N-N-I-C-K, just give him a call over here and uh, we're more than willing to work with you. Thank you all so much. Thanks for having me.